Hello everybody and welcome back. Another single population test on mean. One tail test, sigma unknown. Let's pretend that we don't know that. So we can figure out by looking at the problem, what kind of test is it that we're going to be doing? Well, up until this point, we've only done single population tests, so that almost just goes without saying. But later on, there'll be a wider variety of different tests that we're going to be doing. And so it might be a little bit of a challenge figuring out just what the heck are we testing. Let's read the problem and see what we're working with here. A local fire department has a goal of responding to house fires in under 14 minutes. Well, that's pretty important right there. In order to determine whether they're achieving their goal, they take a sample of 20 every week. The most recent sample had an average of 13.2 and a standard deviation of 2.3. Here's our level of significance. Okay, we've got pretty well everything that we need here to know exactly what it is we're supposed to be testing. We know that we're doing a test with the sample standard deviation. It actually even says sample. If that word wasn't even there, I would still know that it's sample. Well, because that S is telling me that it's a sample standard deviation. Remember, I only use the Z distribution if I'm using the population standard deviation or variance. So I would need to see the word population or I would need to see the symbol for it, sigma or sigma squared. So here I know I'm doing a t-test. I only have sample data that I'm working with. What kind of test is it that we're doing? Well, we want to test to see if they're achieving their goal. They have a goal of responding to house fires in under 14 minutes. Formulate a test to see if we're achieving, see if they are achieving their goal. So I would set this up like this. I would say here's our population mean. Here's our hypothesized value 14. And our goal is to see if we're achieving, uh, if we're under 14. Let me just throw a common mistake out at you. Because what's wrong with this test formulation? I see this so often. Students often struggle with the proper test formulations specifically for one tail test. So, we look at this problem and we'll often see in the null hypotheses, I see that less than under 14 minutes. And that can, I think, lead students to believe that this is the appropriate test. We can't ignore the presence of that equality. This equality is here. You can't just pretend that it's not there. So what I often suggest my students do is to talk through the outcome of different test formulations. What do we learn if the evidence supports the null? What do we learn if the evidence supports the alternative? And does that tell us everything that we need to know? Or does it leave some answered questions? Or does it maybe not even answer our question that we have? So if I had a test formulated like this, well, if I look at the alternative hypotheses, if our evidence supports the alternative, well, it's easy for me to answer the question, right? The question being, are we achieving our goal? If the evidence supports the alternative, my answer to that question is no. Without a doubt, it's no, because my evidence here would say it's actually greater than 14 minutes. So no, you're not achieving our goal. What if the evidence supports the null hypothesis? Can you answer the question of, are we achieving our goal of responding to house fires in under 14 minutes? The answer is, I don't know. I can't answer that question because that equality, whoops, I did just make it disappear. The equality does not just disappear. The equality is there. And so if the evidence supports the null, well, it means that it's, it could be less than, but it could also be equal to 14. And the fact that it could be, if the evidence supports the null, it could be equal to 14. 
Well, that's not our goal. Our goal is that it be under 14. And so we need to really separate that outcome from the three possibilities, less than, equal to, or greater than. So of those three possibilities, I need to isolate the less than, the under 14. And so with that in mind, well, the only way to isolate the less than is by putting it in the alternative hypotheses. Again, because the equality is always in the null. So if my evidence supports the null hypotheses, no, you are not achieving our goal. At best, it's equal to 14, if not greater than. If the evidence supports the alternative, yes, you are achieving your goal. Good. So that's a very long-winded way of justifying or explaining my test formulation. Here we have alpha is 0.05. This is a t-test because I have the sample standard deviation. So my test statistic here is the same as we've seen a few times before. My sample mean, I have 13.2 minus 14 divided by 2.3 over root, there's my sample size there, 20. Now once again, this is um, an, an opportunity to look at the sample data. And, and I've seen this happen so many times before as well. I look at this and I say, well, 13 is less than 14. So yeah, you're achieving your goal, right? 13 is less than 14. Yeah, you're achieving it. But again, remember, that could have just happened by random chance, right? This is just one sample of many samples. That sample mean is a random variable. So that could have happened by random chance. Is it statistically significantly less than 14? That's what we want to know. What's the likelihood that that happened just by random chance, right? If it happened uh, at random with a very, very small probability, well, again, that tells us that probably wasn't just random, right? That probably there's actually something to it. Of course, that's what the p-value approach is, right? So here we have our test statistic. Let's see, I have 13.2 minus 14 divided by 2.3 over root 20. And I got an error, oops, 13.2 minus 14 divided by 2.3. I have negative 1.56. Okay, next step, p-value, critical value. This process is the same, right? I'm using the, the t distribution. I need degrees of freedom, n minus one, 19 degrees of freedom. That describes which variant of the t distribution I'm using. I scroll down to my t tables, and here I have, oops, at 19 degrees of freedom. There's my critical values. I can ignore everything else. And there's the corresponding, remember, upper tail probabilities. Yes, I'm doing a lower tail test, but it's perfectly symmetric. Okay, so my test statistic here was negative 1.56. So I come down, I look at my relevant variant of that distribution, 1.56. So I'm kind of in between these two values here. So those correspond with upper tail probabilities of 0.1 and 0.05. So again, let's just have a little reminder here. This is a symmetric distribution. So here I have 1.7, let's just round it, 1.7 and 1.3. 1.7 and 1.3. In the upper tail from 1.7, I have 0.05. And in the upper tail from 1.3, I have 0 0.1. If 
That's happening in the upper tail. But again, because this distribution is perfectly symmetric, I can look at negative 1.7, negative 1.3, and here I'll have 0.05 in that lower tail, and here I'll have 0.1 in that lower tail. And once more, my test statistic is one negative 1.56. So 1.56 is right in here somewhere. Not exactly in the middle, it doesn't matter. 1.56. So now I can see my p-value for this lower tail test. Well, my p-value is this red area. That red area is less than the green, but it's greater than the purple. So my p-value for this test is somewhere between 0.1 and 0 0.05. Critical value, we're doing this test at, at alpha is 0 0.05. So I can come back here and I can see, well, there's that critical value. I've already made use of it, 1.729. So really, this is that critical value here. And that defines where I will reject and where I do not reject. And here I can see my test statistic is in that do not reject space. Here I can also see my critical value is larger than alpha. Once again, I get consistent results using both approaches. We are unable to reject the null hypotheses. What does that mean? Well, let's come back up to to our problem here. Let's get our results back up here. This was less than 0.1. Here we were talking about responding to emergencies, right? We're looking at the fire department responding to emergencies. So based on just looking at the sample data and saying, oh, okay, 13.2, that's less than 14. Yeah, it looks like we're meeting our, our goal, no problem. But of course, there's variation in that, right? There's random noise in there. We know that there's some inconsistency, right? That that sample mean it's a random variable. It's one of potentially many. Does that sample provide us with enough evidence to show that we are achieving our goal at a statistically significant level? Is that sample mean 3.2? Is that statistically significantly less than 14? At the 0.05 level of significance, our answer is no. We are unable to say that you are achieving your goal. Our evidence here supports the null. Good. Now, the next one, kind of a what if type of a question. What would it mean to commit a type one or a type two error in this scenario? So this is really, you know, just a general understanding of what these types of errors are, but within the context of a particular problem. You know that a type 1 error is rejecting a null when it's true. You know that a type 2 error is accepting it when it's false. Those are the definitions. But generally what I look for in my classroom is a greater understanding as to what that means in the context of the problem. Here we're looking at fire department responding to emergencies. Now, let's first talk about a type 2 error, because that's more what we're at risk at, right? Because our evidence here has supported the null. So we're either correct, or we've made a type 2 error. So what would it mean to commit a type 2 error? Because maybe we did. We'll never know. If we knew, we wouldn't have to do the test. So we don't know. But what would it mean here? Well, it means that this analysis has led us to believe that we are not achieving our goal. What might we do if we're not achieving our goal? We might try to fix that problem. We might want to change something to improve so that we do meet our goal. So what happens here in the, in the case of a type 2 error is we might identify that a problem exists 
that actually it doesn't exist. We might therefore apply some resources, incur some costs to maybe fix a problem that actually doesn't even exist. Because if we've committed a type 2 error, it means that we have been led to believe we're not achieving our goal when in reality we are achieving our goal. But we've been led to believe that we're not. Therefore, we might, we might incur some costs to try to fix this problem that actually doesn't exist because actually we are achieving our goal. So that would be a type 2. Now, if we were exposed to a type 1, a type 1 error means that we reject the true null. Well, if the null is true, if the null is true, then of course that means that we are not achieving our goal. But we've rejected it, which means that we believe that we are achieving our goal. If we commit a type 1 error, well now it means that we believe everything's just fine. We have evidence to show that we are achieving our goal of responding to emergencies in 15, uh, 14 minutes, uh, under 14 minutes. But if we've committed a type 1 error, then this is what we think. My mistake. If we've committed a type 1 error, this is what we think. This is our reality. So we think that we're achieving our goal when in reality we're not. So what this means, of course, in the context of a fire department responding to house fires, everything's going fine. We think we're okay. We're not going to do anything. When in the meantime, maybe people are dying because we're actually not achieving that goal uh, of, of uh, responding to emergencies in less than 14 minutes. So the cost of committing a type 1 error is really what determines the level of significance that we're going to use. In a problem like this, where the cost of committing a type 1 error, thinking that we're achieving our goal when in reality we're not, the cost might be people's homes, people's property, people's lives. So if the cost of a type 1 error is very high, that might give us reason to maybe consider reducing that level of significance. In any case, we're good. Our evidence here, we do support the null hypotheses. We're either correct that we're not achieving our goal and we should probably do something to fix this problem, or we've committed a type 2 error. We are doing fine. We just don't know it. We're going to fix a problem that does not exist. Okay, thank you all for watching. Bye-bye.